It may be hard to imagine, but there was once a time when for seemingly no reason at all that a whole neighbourhood could get ill and drop dead. For many people living in the 1800s London, this was an actual day-to-day -day reality. And scarily, there seemed to be no way to stop it. However, one particular outbreak of cholera in 1854 would change the way scientists look at disease as a whole. And strangely enough, beer would be the catalyst. London in 1854 was a pretty disgusting place. People flooded into the inner city from the provinces and caused a waste disposal issue. The infrastructure for sewage made by Joseph Basil Gett had not yet come to fruition. Due to no proper alternative for disposal, human and animal waste was either dumped into the Thames, into homemade cesspits or out onto the street. Areas like Soho suffered from overcrowding and the primitive sewer system struggled, meaning that the area was a breeding ground of disease and infection. To add salt into the wound, science hadn't quite cracked the way to prevent cholera, mainly due to the leading theory of the disease. And whilst we're on the subject, Let's talk about that particular popular theory. The theory of bad air causing disease harks its history all the way back to ancient China. The miasma theory posed that rotting organic matter created poisonous vapours that would infect any victim that came into contact with it. The theory was used to explain the Black Death. The presence of miasma was thought to be identifiable by a foul smell. Interestingly, pollution and poisonous air is actually dangerous, especially in built-up urbanised areas. I mean, just look at this dust mask that I wore on my commute every day for a month. Ugh. Rotten organic matter and bad smells can be indicators of things you shouldn't be around if you value your health. So the theory does have one lightly placed foot in reality. However, the miasma theory was attached to seemingly unlinked diseases, like in our case cholera, but also plague and even chlamydia. Even obesity was linked to the theory by inhaling the fumes off of food. Pretty much miasma was used to explain a lot of the unknown when it came to health conditions. Conversely, the efforts to reduce miasma did actually lead to a healthier environment indirectly, as local governments' attempts to fight the vicious air actually involved improving sanitary conditions as well as just general cleanliness. Roll on 165 years ago today, or well, at least the date I'm recording this script, the 31st of August 1854, and a major outbreak of cholera in Soho after several years of outbreaks in other parts of London. Within three days, at least 127 residents of Broad Street lay dead from the outbreak, and by the 10th of September, the victim count rose to 500. Many victims were treated by Florence Nightingale at Middlesex Hospital, only a few months before she went to the Crimean War, a place where she would be known as the Lady with the Lamp. Soho, within a week of the outbreak, saw many residents flee the area. Now, never needing an excuse for a day out, Mrs Plainly and I went to Broad Street, now called Broadwick Street, to have a look around so you don't have to. So far, so normal for Victorian-era London, at least during 1849 to 1854 the worst years of the cholera outbreaks. So what makes the Broad Street incident so important to history? Well, it's not the place, but a person who looked into the human tragedy that has cemented the incident in not only London, but world important, as it would be the key turning point in the development of epidemiology. This is where Dr. John Snow enters the scene, a long time skeptic of the miasma theory. Snow in 1854 had a practice off of Thrift Street not far from the epicentre of the outbreak. By this time, Snow was a well-respected doctor, having administered chloroform on Queen Victoria during the birth of her eighth child, Leopold George Duncan Albert, in 1853. Born in 1813 in York, Snow from an early age showed an interest in science and mathematics, starting a medical apprenticeship in 1827 at the young age of just 14. In 1832, he would encounter cholera for the first time, treating many victims of the disease, and in doing so, learning up close its effects and possible causes. In 1837, he began work in Westminster Hospital, London, becoming a member of the Royal College of Surgeons and the Royal College of Physicians, in 1844 and 1850 respectively. From his previous experiences with the disease, Snow was pretty skeptical of the miasma theory and had begun to suspect the source of the outbreak was somehow linked to polluted water due to contact with a pump on Broad Street. 
As soon as the Broad Street incident started to become a full-scale outbreak, Snow set about to investigate the cause in an effort to prove or disprove his theory. Taken to the street with the help of Reverend Henry Whitehead, Snow interviewed local residents both at home and at hospital, asking them where they got their water from. Most people replied, the pump on Broad Street. Several people who lived closer to other pumps had also transmitted the disease, but after interviewing friends and relatives of the victims, it was discovered that many preferred the water from the Broad Street pump. One bizarre case of a victim of the cholera outbreak was a widow in Hampstead, miles away from Soho. It was found that from an interview with the widow's son by Snow, who informed him that his mother had lived in Soho many years before and had liked the water from the pump. It was found out that she sent a servant down to Soho every few days to collect the water. Last time which such a journey was made was on the 31st of August. On the 7th of September, Snow went to the authorities of the St. James's Parish to tell them to remove the handle from the pump as an emergency prevention or further outbreak. The parish obliged as they would try anything to slow the rising death toll. They didn't exactly believe Snow's water transmitted theory, due to the whole miasma thing being prevalent. The epidemic started to subside, however it is not known whether the outbreak had already started to slow down before the handle was removed. Even though Snow had pinpointed the epicentre, he still didn't have enough proof to convince the local authorities what the cause of the outbreak was. This is where Snow's methodical way of working really shined. Over the summer of 1854, Snow revisited his study of the outbreak to try and prove his theory to his contemporaries. By comparing water companies' water in different areas of London, Snow saw an alarming coincidence. Many of the areas in London that were hit the hardest during the cholera epidemic were served by companies that pumped their water from the polluted Thames. The Southwark and Vauxhall Waterworks Company had served the Soho area and they had been pumping pretty much directly from the disgusting Thames, which was also the place that most cesspits were emptied into. Another company called the Lambeth Water Company had also been pumping from the Thames, and many areas they served had also shown high numbers of cholera-linked deaths. Further still, the New River Company pumped water from a different source and filtered out any obvious contaminants before providing to the areas they served and unsurprisingly, their areas of operation had very few cholera-linked deaths. By the end of September, around 616 victims were claimed by the outbreak on Broad Street. Snow used dot maps to plot the area of the outbreak. No points of guessing where the epicentre was by looking at this map. The map showed that the closer to the Broad Street pump you were, the more likely you would have been to be infected. Snow's theory was starting to look, excuse the pun, watertight. However, there was an anomaly in the area. The workers at the Broad Street Brewery, flanked by New Street and Hopkins Street, did not present themselves to the hospital as infected. How could this have been the case? Well, it's the way in which beer is made unknowingly killed the cholera bacteria. If you've ever been camping and taken water from a river to drink, you might know why. The act of boiling and filtering water effectively kills most bacteria, and a key part of brewing beer is, unsurprisingly, boiling it. So, how did no one from the brewery contract the disease? Well, it goes that one of the perks of working for the brewery was that each worker was given an allowance of beer each day, and the workers took it and drank it instead of water. This was a key indicator to Snow that water contamination was the cause of the outbreak. The handle for the pump was later replaced, but by then the outbreak had subsided. The local authorities then lost interest in Snow's theory, instead blaming the whole episode as a bout of bad air. Snow took his theory to the Board of Health, who unsurprisingly rejected his new radical theory. It wouldn't be until 1866 that Snow's results would gain some traction, with William Fars, who was once an opponent to Snow's thinking's research into an outbreak in Bromley by Bow. Unfortunately, Snow didn't get the chance to enjoy the recognition for his theory, as he passed away in 1858 from a stroke. However, the research he did would help to change the opinion of the propagation of the disease, as Snow's theories would be generally accepted after the development of germ theory in 1883 under the German Robert Koch. Later it would be found out that the Broad Street Pumps well had been dug 900 centimetres from an old cesspit, and wastewater from used nappies had leaked into the pit. The nappies were from a baby that had contracted cholera from another source and the cesspit had leaked into the well, hence causing the outbreak. Snow's legacy isn't hard to find, especially in Soho, with a fake pump in the place of the deadly original, right outside the aptly named John Snow pub. However, the area has changed since Snow's time, 
with the brewery now this building and obviously jam-packed London traffic. If you're in central London, it is definitely worth checking out and why not pop into the pub to celebrate Snow's legacy with a cholera beating pint. Hello, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave me a like. Do you have any suggestions for future videos? Then let me know in the comments below. If you would like to have a Plainly D t-shirt, I now have a Teespring store. I also have a Patreon page if you fancy supporting the channel. And also I have a Twitter which I post random facts and other things that I find interesting. I look forward to seeing you on the next video. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.